Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is a little bit different to uh, this segment um, because I got an email from Rachel Harrington after the last live event. And she said, look, I'm working on Project Warp Speed for the, the Health and Human Services on a lot of the uh, therapeutics that you've been talking about. And uh, do you want to get some sort of insight as to how things are running? And of course, I said, yes, let's get you on the line and have a discussion. Now, full disclosure, as you're about to find out, um, Rachel worked for many years for Pfizer doing uh, research for Pfizer. Now she's working in government, and obviously there's been quite a melding of what is happening in the industry and in government over this uh, COVID-19 situation. So with that um, in mind, some really, really fascinating information about how you recruit patients and how you get them and how you might be involved or your hospital might be involved as we try and get more information about therapeutics. So here we go. All right, uh, Rachel, tell us uh, who you are, uh, what you were before, what you are today, there's lots of potential conflicts of interest here as we've got sort of government and industry trying to come up with all this stuff. And I think we sort of accept that, that there's this uh, mash, but, but for full disclosure, tell us who you are, what you were before and your position right now. Okay, I am Rachel Harrigan. I am the clinical advisor liaison for uh, several of the active studies being run or being funded by Operation Warp Speed, which I'll refer to as OWS. I am a family doctor by training who's spent uh, several decades in the pharmaceutical industry running large uh, clinical studies and running uh, Pfizer's clinical development operations globally. And I was um, asked to help out with Operation Warp Speed to report to Janet Woodcock, who was... Um, who recused herself from her position as head of CEDA for the FDA to head up the OWS therapeutics uh, efforts. Um, and she asked me to help out to get a clear line of sight for OWS to the clinical studies. And OWS provides the funding for those. They're, they were designed by ACTIVE and the NHLBI, um, and uh, as well as expediting the execution of those studies. So in addition to funding, what other resources uh, do they need and what roadblocks could we help, uh, help them remove? So let me see if I can simplify it or understand it. So here's a pandemic, new virus, lots of companies out there that make vaccines. And um, the US government is saying, okay, we need to rapidly, faster than ever occurred in history, create vaccines test the vaccines, but also manufacture the vaccines all at the same time. So prepared to lose lots of money by saying, um, let's, we have to do this instead of doing it one after another. Uh, we have to do it all at the same time. So is that sort of the correct understanding of what's going on right now? That is the correct understanding. But for clarification, I'd just like to add that I'm not working on the vaccine side. So what, the vaccines is the uh, more glamorous and expensive component of Operation mm -hmm. Warp Speed. But the other component is on the therapeutic side. So okay. how can we provide uh, patients with COVID with short-term treatments that will improve the mortality and morbidity associated with this dreadful disease? So that's been two-pronged. That's been on um, attacking the virus with um, monoclonal antibodies or convalescent plasma. So basically boosts the, the patient's immune system short-term. And then the other component is managing the complications. And that's where um, these anticoagulant studies come in about what is the best standard of care, both in an inpatient and an outpatient setting for the use of um, either therapeutic or prophylactic anticoagulants. So that's actually very interesting because I thought warp speed was just vaccines. And when you talk mm -hmm. about warp speed, I thought vaccines. So it's both therapeutics and vaccines. Yes. And, and, and up till now, there's been a limited amount of information on the therapeutic side, just because there is a very carefully controlled uh, media distribution and how they decide to publicize it. So, but now with the um, two uh, active studies starting, active two outpatient, active three inpatient for monoclonal antibodies, then obviously those studies get posted to the CTGov website. There's information distributed about the um, the, the outline of those those protocols and the nature of the study. So there's there's been a lot more um, uh, ability now to com communicate on the OWS therapeutics. And when I saw on your podcast, your last podcast, that you had um, mentioned the Active Three study, and thank you very much for the shout out. Um, but you'd also uh, touched on a number of other agents that um, 
active and the NHLBI is working on in this Operation Warp Speed therapeutics arena. I have a very selfish motive here in that some of the studies will be are likely to be uh, difficult to recruit. And we know that there's a lot of competing studies out there. And we wanted to increase awareness of that, both for emergency room doctors and for um, patients, if they're listening in, about, about the nature of these studies. Because it does tend to be that the patients show up and if they're not sick enough to be admitted, then they, they go home and we don't see them again necessarily. So there's that challenge about uh, testing them, uh, pre-screening if needed, doing the rapid screening, and then and then signing them up for some of these um, some of these outpatient studies, and ideally catching them early in the course of the disease, especially for the antibody um, studies, where it's anticipated that the earlier intervention is likely to be the most effective for the patient. So, can you outline for us uh, what um, particular studies are looking at what it is and where they are in the in the phase of the, the work right now. So you've got an antibody study. Tell us about that one. Is that active three? Okay, so the active three study is the inpatient study and that's designed as a um, two-stage phase three study. So the compounds have some clinical information before they enter. It's designed as a master protocol adapted design uh, with an early readout at the end of the first stage where 150 patients have either received the investigational product or standard of care. And then um, at the end of, you know, for the first agent, that's N equals 300, there's an early look to see if they uh, clear some fairly low thresholds for safety and efficacy to be able to go into the broader uh, phase of the study where the primary endpoint is sustained recovery for two weeks out of the hospital and not passing away and not being readmitted to another hospital. Um, and that's got a 90 day follow up in recognition that there is a long sequelae um, to this disease and that often patients are readmitted after they're discharged. Um, that, those were some of the learnings from the, uh, from the uh, earlier studies that were conducted. Um, so that is an active, that's the active three inpatient protocol. Um, and as I said, it's designed to roll in um, investigational products on a rolling basis with a shared placebo group for efficiency. Um, and then if, if they fail, then they drop out early and we keep enrolling products in. There's an independent um, data safety monitoring board that's shared with the active two outpatient study, which is studying similar agents. Um, and they look at the safety on a regular basis. And they'll also look for signals of either futility or um, early success. And if there's early success, they'll obviously put their head up early and saying, right, we've got enough here for doing an emergency use authorization. And that would, uh, that would be uh, pretty rapidly communicated as uh, hopefully a new standard of care for patients uh, with the disease. There's a similar effort going on on the outpatient side. That's set up as a phase two, three study. Um, and the... Um, with virology and symptomatology in the in the in stage two, with about 110 patients per arm, and then it goes through into a much broader phase three program. We're looking at a thousand patients per arm to demonstrate symptomatology recovery um, at, uh, over the course of 28 days. Uh, that's going to be the hardest study to recruit. It's obviously easier to get patients to sign up when they're in patients, and it's a lot harder in the outpatient setting. Um, in terms of diagnosing them rapidly, uh, doing the appropriate tests, and then arranging the follow-up. And the follow-up is going to be key there as well, because um, if patients, it, it's different to know, obviously, if patients have dropped out because they've had an adverse event, that's a finding in itself, right? But if they're dropped out just because they lost a follow-up, then the, it really makes that, that, that patient not that useful necessarily, depending on the time of the dropout for the uh, intent to treat analysis for, for phase three. Active 2 has a similar design that it's designed to be an adaptive master protocol so that compounds come in um, and it can uh, roll out uh, either futility early or can continue again with the same DSMB sticking their hand up saying, hey, we've got a winner here uh, for early success. So where are you in uh, the stage of these? Because obviously we're all uh, sitting on spilkes, I think is the uh, term. On the edge of our seats, like when is the data going to come out? We're all desperate to know. Where are you in these studies? The studies have just started. So the um, ACT2-3 um, study has been run through um, 
uh, a massive um, uh, network called the Insight Networks, which was set up for HIV, and also two NHLBI networks, the PETAL network and the CTSN networks, and also through a number of veterans associate uh, affairs um, sites that are, are hooked in as well. So that is, um, those sites are already being uh, activated in the US and then will be followed by international sites. But it's anticipated that probably about 80% of the sites will be US and the rest will be um, international. So that, that study has started enrolling. Um, the other study is about to start enrolling. They are activating sites this week. And again, they're following a similar approach. They're using um, uh, ACD, CTG, another AIDS network, and also a CRO uh, network of sites across the US. And they uh, will be enrolling patients uh, probably later this week, hopefully. So just at the very early stages, and in terms of your question about um, readout, that really does depend on the ability of recruiting patients quickly into the study, knowing that there are competing studies and that often institutes sign up for the um, for multiple studies and that also if we you know we try and hard target the pandemic hotspots but right. if we get there too late and especially we, uh, we're seeing we're seeing it for example now tail off in North Carolina where there was a big peak and then after the last couple of days it's tailed off again um, but also we don't want to uh, only target just the hotspots it's sort of the sweet spot where the clinical site has the capacity to do the resource intensive clinical studies and consent the patient, which takes many hours in terms of the explanation, even if these are experienced researchers, but not, not seeing so many patients that they're overwhelmed because th that is, it's a, um, you know, it's a tightrope in, in that regard. Um, but we, um, there is going to be a massive recruitment campaign, especially on the outpatient side, the NHLBI is about to start an inpatient study, an outpatient study, and also probably a convalescent um, recovering patient study um, for studying the use of uh, both therapeutic and prophylactic anticoagulants in those patient settings. This is fascinating because we in the ER don't sort of think too much about how you recruit. Um, and this idea that this is moving so fast. So you have an explosion of cases. And I think what you're saying is like, when it's like New York at the peak, nobody's going to enroll anybody in a study. They didn't have time. If there's no cases at all, you're not, it's a worthless site. Um, so you have to find that sweet spot. So how do you do that? Are you looking at modeling going, okay, that looks like the next peak is going to be in Florida in this area and we start recruiting? Are you actually modeling like that? Or do you just sort of look what's happening right now and pick up the phone and start calling dots? No, it, there's a lot of epi modeling going on and there's a couple of efforts going on that we've uh, used from the vaccine group. So they have a predictive analytics working group. They also had a separate working group within the OWS, the clinical trial capacity working group. They use different models, but they had similar outputs. Uh, one was using the University of Penn, the other one was using the University of Washington for the different epi modeling. And then we're also in discussions with another company about getting the uh, non-US epi modeling. Um, and the, uh, the vaccines effort is uh, based on 200 plus real-time sources through uh, the CDC. So they, they follow those in, they, they, they give us a, a real-time heat map, and then they'll give predictions, you know, um, two, four, six weeks out. And it's a bit, somebody described it yesterday as about trying to pin the tail on the donkey. It's, it's very hard to do. It's very easy with the Monday morning quarterback to say, oh, you should have done this, or this is where it's going to go. But there's a lot of uh, variability. But yes, there's a, uh, we'll be looking at heat maps. In the Active 3, for example, there's a, these network of networks um, have a large number of sites. And what they are, the strategy there is they're going to register a lot of sites, get them active, which means they'll have done everything except get drug. And then when it looks like they are in an area where there's a lot of cases that they can enroll, then they get drug and the drug is being shipped from a central pharmacy. So it's a different strategy rather than saying, here are all the sites we're gonna use, we're gonna send them all drug. Because when you've got an investigational product, it's really hard 
nigh on impossible to move it between sites. So once you've sent it, it's very hard to get it back. It's, it's essentially often wasted, unfortunately. Remdesivir is slightly different because that's standard of care, so you can move that about, but investigational product, no, a different story. So that's why there's this uh, kind of central pharmacy approach, which Insight, the network had developed, which has worked very well in their, their previous large HIV studies to say, okay, we've got it close to the sites. We've got the sites ready to go and then they're activated real time. It's more costly because it's very resource intensive. You have to have the, all of the prep work done with the sites, all of the IRB approvals, all the paperwork, the ICFs, all of that, CRFs, everything already lined up um, and the training done uh, before you can actually say, okay, right, that site is ready to go. But that, that is a strategy and many of the other studies are following a similar approach. So it will be more sites than would have been traditionally enrolled in a uh, different type of setting where perhaps the uh, urgency was less pressing. How quickly, let's say I'm uh, the research director at a hospital here in Los Angeles, and we don't have any association with any of these groups right now, but I'm like, okay, I heard this talk and I really wanna participate. How quickly can you get me up and running as a site in the ER and the ICU to start being part of this um, consortium? Is it? Months, days, weeks, hours. Okay, so th there's 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 two answers to that question. One is is whether you're willing to refer your patients to a site nearby. You know, so if you've got an outpatient that you were sending home, um, it would be uh, very quick to then say, okay, here are the here are the sites near you with an X radius that are either recruiting for an outpatient anticoagulant study or for the outpatient monoclonal antibody study. Setting you up as a new site is somewhat different. If you're a large institute, it's quite likely that somebody already within your institute may be registered as that clinical site. So that would be the first thing. And if that's a yes, that's easy. That's really a case of you, again, referring your patient to that, that person who's already signed up as an investigator for that clinical study. Starting you up as a new site is very labor intensive. So I would turn the question around because it also depends. We discovered the key to success with any uh, clinical study, is that it's not just the interest of the PI, it's having those dedicated research staff available, specifically the coordinator. If you don't have that, if your coordinator's gone on vacation that week, you don't get patients. It's, it's really as straight line as that, the association between the two. So it really would be, then also become a question for the, 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 the person who's inquiring about whether they have the bandwidth to become a site or whether it's really that they've got patients and they want to see if their patients are eligible to enter into a clinical trial that's ongoing.